There are a lot of unique things in anime that we find ourselves clamoring for. Things that anime does differently from other media, from other cultures, but sometimes you don't really want or need to watch an anime that focuses on the meaning of friendship, one that dives into the inner workings of someone's soul, or teaches you things about yourself that you would never have learned otherwise. Or rather, you want to have that, but disguise it as a series full of mindless fun and senseless violence, and what you get is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Stardust Crusaders. I'd say that before watching this video, you should make sure you've watched previous parts of JoJo, but I'm not gonna say that, because as I iterated in my review of them, Phantom Blood was shite, and honestly, there's not enough callbacks to battle tendency in Stardust to make you really feel like you're missing out if you started here. That's not me saying to start here, though, because Battle Tendency is freaking amazing and you're doing yourself a disservice by skipping it, but I will admit it's not necessary for the enjoyment of the show that we are going to be talking about today. So, without further ado, ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Alcada, and welcome to Glass Reflection, where today we are looking at a series that is actually legitimately good. The third part of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Stardust Crusaders. Let's jam. So, just in case you guys forgot or don't know the story of JoJo up until this point... One eternity later... Though honestly, the story of Stardust is extremely straightforward. It's the part where shit gets real! Dio is back, surprise surprise, because that fucker can't seem to ever stay dead in the ground. Some new spiritual chicanery is happening as well, and a bunch of people in the world can now summon personas, or stands, to fight one another to the death. These new stands nullify the role previously held by Hamon and its Sunny D-like superpowers. We also have a new Jojo, and this Jojo, Jotaro, has his mother fall ill due to the existence of stands, and the only cure is to fly halfway across the world to Egypt and punch Dio in his smarmy smug face, which Jotaro kindly obliges. So alongside his grandfather Joseph and his newly acquired pals, Abdul, Kakyoin, and Ponarif, the group have an adventure that none of them is likely to forget, and neither are you, unless you decide to not pay attention and fall asleep in some of the more repetitive bits of the story. Because Stardust would have made for a very short series if they just hopped on a plane, got to Egypt in 12 hours, and made it back in time for some jasmine tea the next day. So continually our heroes are bombarded by enemy combatants, turning their quick hop to Egypt into a slog-like long haul. It takes over 20 episodes for the gang to actually make it into Egypt, and then another 14 to 15 or so until they make it to Dio's front door. Thankfully, the journey from Japan to Egypt is where the bulk of the entertainment with this series actually lies. Because we know how this journey is going to end. We know that down the line the series is just going to finish off with three or so episodes of two guys trying to punch each other to death, so why bother rushing to get there when the unknown and entertainment is in the actual adventure itself. Now, on the surface, there's a bunch to criticize. Every episode is formatted identical to the last, so let's look over the anatomy of a Stardust episode, shall we? Hey, something bizarre is happening! Whatever could be happening! Oh, this is the work of an enemy stand! Kill the enemy stand! Roll credits. Most everything else is identical to how JoJo played out its format previously with some minor changes. There's no new random enemy names based off of popular English rock stars anymore, at least not until the very end. Instead, the names are based off of Egyptian gods, and even before that, tarot cards, making the Persona comparison even more accurate. Come. Go on! There isn't much variety in the format of the story either, but instead the entertainment comes from the variety of content. Every unfortunate thing that occurs on this trip is always, always because of an anime stand, and the powers of these stands vary widely and actually tell why the hell bizarre is a word used in the show's title. Each new anime stand has an interesting and unique design and superpower that must be overcome if our heroes want a chance of continuing their adventure. At the start, the powers of the enemy stands are rather simple and mundane, but as the series progresses, they start to become more 
complex and creative. This continues the tradition from previous JoJo arcs where the enemies need to be faced in a smart and proactive manner instead of just punching things hard enough until they die. They all have these magical powers that make them unique, but as soon as you figure out their trick, they can be taken down rather easily. Watching our heroes do the analyzing and figuring out how to combat their enemies is the fun part. It, it, so it's great that Stardust continues this until Jotaro gets involved in the fight. Jotaro is actually one of the problems I have with Stardust. He doesn't have much of a personality like his predecessors. He's a one-trick pony whose only role is to be a silent badass, which, to be fair, he does extremely well, but it doesn't really make his character any less one-dimensional. Because of the boy band nature of the main cast, Jotaro doesn't get as much focus as Joseph did in Battle Tendency, or John did during Phantom, which leaves him to be excluded from a lot of the action. But the times when he's not excluded are when he mostly stands there glaring at enemies before closing range and punching them 10,000 times until they fall over dead and it's rare to see Jotaro lose a fight. In the past, one of the things that defined the role of a Jojo was to be able to analyze when they were outmatched and reposition themselves to get a better advantage. This was Joseph's whole shtick, but Jotaro doesn't run away. He's a cold ass motherfucker who will wreck your shit. Now, this could be trying to differentiate him from Joseph who ran away constantly, but it almost makes me wonder why from a practical perspective, why didn't Jotaro just do the journey himself, as he is obviously powerful enough to have done the entire thing solo with energy to spare? But that's kind of the thing. Because Jotaro was designed this way as a character, the rest of the cast was brilliantly designed around him to compensate. Jotaro is not in every fight, or even the majority of fights, I feel like, leaving Kakyoin and Ponarif to pick up the slack. In actuality, I felt like Ponerifu felt far more like the main character of this arc, if for no other reason than the fact that almost every single enemy Stan user got to shout his name angrily like it was their favorite word in the world. One of the criticisms that you could lay upon the previous arcs of Jojo is that they focused far too much on Jojo himself to the detriment of the supporting cast, and I honestly think that Stardust attempted to counter that, but went a little bit too far. Hell, no one even really calls Jotaro Jojo in this series, which is odd, and the complete removal of all interesting characteristics from Joseph so that he doesn't steal the spotlight was a bit of a disappointment for me. I've said before that I believe Joseph to be best Jojo, maybe not strongest Jojo, as I think Jotaro could probably beat him in a straight up fight, but the style and class that used to ooze from every pore in his body has been surgically removed from his older self. Like I can count on one hand the amount of times that he used Hamon or anything resembling his abilities that allowed him to previously defeat literal gods. Y yes, I know that only stands can defeat other stands, and Joseph's stand is conveniently garbage in combat, but to see him not even use his trademark opponent prediction trick more than, what, I think once in almost 50 episodes? That's a travesty. And next you'll say... But there was a status quo to uphold in JoJo canon, and the empty space left behind by Old Man Speedwagon had to be filmed by someone. But there was a status quo to uphold in JoJo canon, and the empty space left behind by Old Man Speedwagon had to be filled by someone. So Joseph got demoted from fucking boss to the guy who sprouts random English for comedic effect. Oh shit! Oh, no! oh my god! The later inclusion of the comedic effect dog Iggy didn't do much for me either. I have no doubt that Iggy has some diehard fans, especially after watching his character do an almost 180 in personality near the end, but his jumping into people's faces just to make a loud and audible <coughs> fart was more cringeworthy than humorous to me. Also, this is the part where I lament the loss of Roundabout by Yes as the show's ending theme. I, I do understand that Roundabout wouldn't have worked as well this time around as there were far less cliffhangers and the episodic nature didn't really lend itself to the kind of endings that made Roundabout great, but it's still sad to see it go. 
ultimately as harsh as I'm sounding, Stardust is really just more of the same great JoJo with a different coat of paint. Some of its major flaws, like with the other parts, can just be chalked up to the fact that the story is over 25 years old, and many of the elements that seem cliche now were made popular by JoJo in the first place. If you want to watch an anime about a group of bros bonding over life or death, then there's no better option. Hell, if you just want to watch an entertaining romp for like 50 episodes, there's very few that can match it. I, I, I did feel like Stardust was a step back in scale, but it was a necessary one. While the threat posed by Dio was one that was far less world-ending than that of the Pillar Men from the previous arc, the continual power creep of Jojo villains could not continue exponentially like it was going without, you know, stalling, and this step back was one that could have been handled far worse. On top of which, it improved from previous iterations by giving us a full cast of characters to get attached to and love, which is one of the season's shining achievements, even if Jotaro suffered a bit as a character to account for that. Still though, it's not like he is going anywhere, and maybe my thoughts about him will change when I finally get around to watching all of Diamond, but that's for another time. So, overall, I would like to present Stardust Crusaders with the Glass Reflection recommendation to buy it. But you can, because the license is in this weird place where Warner Brothers got it, but haven't released it on DVD or anything, despite having dubbed the whole thing. There was a Toonami showing of the art, but it still seems kind of a waste to, to dub it but not give it a wider release. But even without the dub, you can watch it on Crunchyroll and the like without too much issue. For alternate anime recommendations, because I haven't referenced this franchise enough already in this video, I'm going to bring up Persona 4 The Animation. While technically not as good as its video game counterpart, I found P4 The Animation to be a reasonably faithful adaptation of the original story, which has enough similarities with common JoJo tropes to be enjoyable if JoJo is your thing. Second recommendation goes to the 2011 adaptation of Hunter x Hunter. I know that I recommended it back when I reviewed Phantom Blood and Battle Tendency, but it is a long series that is worth the watch, and I still honestly feel like not enough people have actually gone and watched it yet, so I'm gonna keep hawking it until then. And between those two, you should find something to your liking. And finally, I would like to thank my patrons and all of my patrons for their help, including Siri Yamako, Bing Theo, Victor Ekmark, Yunru Dover Queen, Jacob Parkin, Joshua Garcia, Calhoun Boy, and Robert Chumzai, without whom I would not be able to produce these videos to the same extent that I would like. And that's it for me. Thank you for watching, and until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, stay frosty.